Uh, and our next speaker will be in tone about business cases for privacy enhancing photography. Um, Do you have my slides? Yes. It's very different from my usual talks. So um, what inspired this was I was feeling burnt out and I was like, does anyone care that I removed like three FFTs and two MSMs <laughs> with my new lookup argument? And is anyone ever going to use it? So I feel like proof singularity, the vibe is sort of like taking a step back and um, sort of, so like Wei Dai's talk was, I think, mostly about benchmarks. And all of the work in the past few years have been about better benchmarks and efficiency. Whereas my talk is going to cover like the higher level motivations as well. So yeah, I, I don't know if you guys saw this Paulina blog post where she, they said that um, there's only a very narrow class of applications for which blockchains make sense. And it turns out that um, there's only two, objective money and objective identity. So I wanted to do something similar for ZK applications. And yes, so they laid out a criteria that we need P2P, global consensus, and objectivity. Whereas for ZK snarks, I think we need basically that a single prover um, holds a witness. And the caveat is that this is not true for collaborative proving, um, but in most cases. And that the proof has to be publicly verifiable um, which also means that um, it must be publicly known, um, the set of invariants that we desire. And lastly, efficiently verifiable. So ZK proofs only make sense if your verifier is very resource constrained. Um, and so yeah, I think there's two classes of applications, um, anonymous credentials and attested computation. And I, I hope to be challenged on this. Like, actually, also interrupt me at any time. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. OK, cool. So yeah, I think the first part would be more boring to you guys, because these are all applications that we know. Um, my, my objective is just to classify them in this way. So yeah, for anonymous credentials, um, we have um, signaling and nullifiers or rate limits. And yes, yeah, signaling um, consists of two parts. The first part is some kind of authentication protocol. So yeah, um, the most common types of authentication are proving either membership or non-membership in a known set. And then on top of authentication, we can build the signal. So payments, voting, maybe like messaging in the Discord or very general interactions like what Nocturne allows, like any transaction. So the point of um, this first class of applications is that most of the protocol is outside of it. And what you're using the zero knowledge proof to do is to authenticate um, your ability to participate in the protocol. Um, so yeah, the main sort of challenge faced by um, anonymous credential applications is regulation and compliance. Um, and yeah, I've started looking at basically solutions for compliant privacy, which sounds like a paradox already. But um, so there has been work on this like f from like even since 2016, I think, um, and it comes under many names like revocable privacy, privacy budgets, accountable privacy, programmable privacy, in a very different way than <laughs> what Flashbots means. Um, basically, the idea that um, we can allow regulators and auditors to program um, the types of privacy that they allow. Um, and recently, the US Treasury, last September, they acknowledged that, um, they mentioned here zero knowledge proofs. Um, they acknowledged that it's useful uh, for authentication, um, yeah, basically to confirm that an identity has been verified without revealing personal information. So to me, this is encouraging that, yeah, 
um, like these attempts to bootstrap privacy onto CBDCs, I think are better than nothing. Yeah. Any questions here? I I think this part is very controversial. Yeah. So like, what about let's say you go through like an AML process and you prove that you're at least like a reputable individual? You still might want to stay anonymous, right? So is that kind of the idea that they're saying that you could be like compliant or like built in like a requirement to be compliant without revealing your identity directly or is it public? Yeah, I think that's what the treasury thing is saying, what you said. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, reputation is also a kind of signal um, that you can um, anonymously give. So. Yeah, like I think reputation networks would be a very important primitive for like credit networks and under collateralized lending. Um, but yeah, besides this, um, the uh, this line of work it, it kind of goes further than that. It's saying um, privacy budgets. So for example, um, your transactions are private if they're below ten thousand dollars, or your transactions are private for two weeks per month, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and any, any system of anonymous credentials and signaling needs rate limits. So nullifiers, rate, limi rate limiting nullifiers are examples of this. And the second class of application, I think, is attested computation. So in contrast to the first class, most of the protocol is inside the computation. Um, and yeah, there's two kind of subcategories. The first is when the protocol itself is public. It's a standard, it's well known. So for example, yeah, hardware, virtual machines like RISC-V, um, email, um, Ethereum protocol, all of these are examples of very well-known public protocols that we wanna check um, is being fulfilled. Public model machine learning is one. And I think very interestingly, like zero knowledge proofs are um, a necessary primitive in any FHA solution today. So yeah, to, to make sure that our ciphertexts are meaningful. Um, and I mentioned at the start of this talk that zero knowledge proofs are also useful for collaborative proving or also known as publicly verifiable MPC. Yeah, so it, encryption and MPC are also examples of public protocols that we want to encode inside a proof. And the other type of attested computation is when most of your protocol is actually private. So for example, private model machine learning, but you want to check certain invariants on it. And the invariants are usually like a lot lighter than the actual protocol. So these are two new use cases that I haven't seen people talk about. But yeah, I was just looking for these cases where um, there's some proprietary and very powerful model that's being used to make decisions about public goods. So for example, governments, they regularly um, engage private consultants like Deloitte um, to recommend how to allocate public resources. And we don't know how they're doing it. So we can at least like, um, test some attributes about their models. And also this weird example that I found was, um, so carbon credits are valued using a really convoluted counterfactual reasoning. And it turns out most of the industry is using one single um, company and no one knows what their magic model does or if they're even using the same model for everyone. So to me, that's very clear use case where ZK private model ZKML is strictly better. And yeah, so I, I would like to, I would like to brainstorm more use cases like that are shaped like this, um, where like some intellectual property is being used for decisions about public goods. Um, and a proof of exploit is another one. So yeah, you don't reveal your exploit, but um, you're able to prove that it violates some invariants. Yeah. Like, uh, one thing that uh, popped up recently was sort of proof of sovereignty. 
Yeah. Yeah, proof of solvency, definitely. Um, yeah, that one is really tricky. I was talking to someone um, who's, who told me like, pr proof of solvency is fine, but, <laughs> but your balance sheets is not just assets, right? It's liabilities. So you need to prove that you have assets, but can you prove that you don't have liabilities that are greater than that? But yeah, anyway, proof of solvency is also one example for sure. So yeah, I think that was the boring part. I wanted to classify already known applications and also give people ideas for directions um, to explore. So now moving on to standardization and benchmarks. These are the things that I think are lacking and that will bring us closer to industry adoption. So um, NIST recently put out a threshold call, uh, a call for yeah, specifications of um, threshold schemes. And in this sec cate category, C2.7, they, they mention explicitly zero knowledge proofs. Um, so, but they're only interested in two types. So proof of knowledge of a private key or proof of knowledge of some kind of um, pre-image. Um, so there's a bunch of people at ZK Proof Standards, I think maybe some are in this room, um, who have been working on um, specifying the Planck um, proof system. and. One of the places we're hoping to submit is the NIST threshold call. So you might say, like, isn't Planck too general and too heavy for, for these two specific proofs of knowledge? So I think the line of reasoning we have is um, that, yeah, if we, if we submitted a purpose-built um, ZK snark, that would be way more efficient because we would save time on arithmetization. Um, but um, for each new purpose-built ZK snark, we would need to like analyze its security afresh. Whereas um, if we standardize a general purpose one, then we do that analysis one time. Um, but we pay the cost of arithmetization. Yeah. So. Um, I've been, I don't know if Han is in this room, but um, we've been working on the Oracle compiler part of the proving stack. And so what our work has involved is basically asking a bunch of people in academia and industry about um, how they're using Oracle compilers and what, um, what, what they're assuming, what properties they're assuming that the Oracle compilers have. So for example, like, does the Oracle compiler preserve zero knowledgeness when it goes from the IOP um, to the argument? Um, or yeah, whether, whether or not we can standardize both like univariate and multi-linear polynomial commitment schemes in the same spec. So actually there's really deep like um, questions that are revealed by like looking into the details of implementations. And if anyone has um, any interest in contributing to, contributing to these standards, you can talk to me or you can, I guess, email ZK Proof Standards. Um, and a third um, effort at standards, I don't know how many of you are on Zupas and have this <laughs> hideous frog. <Exactly>. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so I'm not special, but <laughs> yeah. Basically, you can see like, it's, it's really outrageous. They gave you this frog and they're like, view as proof carrying data. <laughs> so yeah, Xerox Park is attempting to have an SDK that um, provides this interface for yeah, messages of the form claim and proof. Um, and I have been very impressed by Zupas and um, the fact that they've onboarded some other people onto it. Um, cool. I think that's my time because um, Wei Dai covered all these benchmarks. But I think Wei Dai, you were, you were at the asymptotics more. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, there's like 
the point of this slide was that there's, there's benchmarks at many different levels. Um, maybe the one I'll mention is the, what Ingonyama just proposed, ZK score. So their ZK score is in this unit, like MOP per joule, modular multiplications per joule. Um, and they took inspiration from like how AI companies have been benchmarking their operations. Um, yeah, so we definitely also need better benchmarks. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had. Thank you. Stocks. Yeah. Last year there was a paper from Dan about collaborative stocks. So is it something that you think is not, uh, there's not much application for it? Or yeah, I... It's just the very beginning, so that might be the reason why you didn't think about this. So. Yeah, it's a good question. So collaborative snarks, basically it's like publicly verifiable MPC, um, where like you secret share your witness and then have the parties um, collaborative com run the SNARK prover computation. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely interesting applications for that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I was just making the case that most applications now only involve a single prover. Yeah, I think actually one of the um, questions I have about proof singularity is like to what extent it accounts for like these kinds of collaborative proving or yeah compute over like multiple parties private inputs so we our users prove all their transactions and then the only thing that like the network does, has to do collaboratively is just like you know, yeah, I think by collaboratively, what I would mean there is like, let's say two users make a swap, and but they don't want to reveal their um, their assets to each other if the swap fails. Okay, got you. So yeah. like we want to be able to commit to an action. So the two users want to do an MPC, basically. Okay. Yeah. Like, you, you could imagine something like credit system in which uh, the swap actually goes through some intermediaries and you do not uh, reveal to anybody else anything. So it's all so that it's the like swap is just don't know. So it's also was. partially of chain. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I have like sort of overall like, general question, um, which is, okay, I, I have a sort of like chart uh, regarding that the K, uh, also can be sort of like centralized and decentralized. Like examples with intellectual property, you, you could imagine, for example, a system with steganography in, in which you can slash people who leak the data. Or mm. like to, by proving that some sort of steganographic imprint exists in this data. Or something like this. Uh, and on the other hand, we have like full anarchy, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever any type of uh, So uh, my question is, uh, um, so my question is, uh, um, like m most of these business applications, I think think are fairly li li uh, leaning uh, into the sort of like centralized applications in the sense that they give more control to the. Uh, like government parts or whatever. So my question is, are, are we screwed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, for example, these two, these two examples that I said are um, basically holding centralized bodies accountable and giving the public a way to audit them. Yeah, so... Well, that's strictly better than not knowing what they're sure, doing. They don't want us to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. I mean, there is a good, a good essay by Molly Wright on okay. digital identity. 
And uh, what she basically says is like being able to prove some data means that you can be coerced by market to like prove this data, to prove this. So uh, this is still more data uh, that you will be probably forced to reveal if you like can easily prove it. Mm, so like but proof of exploit is a good example of something which is like probably on our side. Hmm. And, and I think there is some person who loaded Linux compiled to risk uh, zero, yeah. so it's not even far away. Yeah. It took a like, small cluster. Happy result, and uh, thank yeah. you so much for coming.